Live from Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. Charges dismissed today for a former San Antonio police officer accused of kneeling on a suspect's neck back in 2019. Michael Brewer facing a third degree felony charge. Erica Hernandez breaks down why the district attorney's office closed the case. He was charged with unlawful restraint in 2020 and fired from SAPD. But today, Michael Brewer is no longer facing any more legal troubles. In fact, his attorney telling us he should have never been indicted. Back on November 26, 2019, officers responded to a disturbance call at Commercial Avenue in Grosvenor Boulevard. Brewer and another officer, Andre Vargas, arrested Matthew Anthony Garza after he allegedly tried to abduct a child. A taser even had to be used during the arrest. A few months later, Garza filed a complaint about his arrest, and after reviewing the incident, investigators found Vargas used unnecessary force and Brewer placed his left knee on Garza's head and neck. But attorney Ben Sinfuentes telling us this afternoon that the footage actually never showed such an act. We played the video frame by frame and showed that at no point in time can we see uh, weight being applied to the neck. For whatever reason, someone in the DA's office thought they were going to play cute with the statute of limitations because when the case was indicted, the statute of limitation for official oppression had already expired and the statute of limitation for aggravated assault had already expired. Vargas was not criminally charged in the incident, but Brewer was indicted and has spent the past few years fighting his case. Sinfuentes now says that Brewer, now free from any charges, will be working toward getting his job back with SAPD. We asked District Attorney Joe Gonzalez about the dismissal, and he told us that since he hadn't been briefed on it yet, he could not comment but could provide comment later this week. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A twist in a murder investigation. She was about to get on a plane when San Antonio police arrested a woman who claimed she was being held at gunpoint in connection with her husband's death. That claim may not have been true. Mary Ann Dimitro is charged with altering, destroying, and concealing a human corpse. Dimitro told police she was being held against her will Sunday morning after a man named Jose Alvarez shot her husband and killed him. The three were inside Alvarez's apartment in the 4,000 block of Medical Drive on the northwest side. She originally told police she escaped Alvarez's apartment and called to report her husband's murder. They determined, though, she was actually trying to help Alvarez. She actually assisted the suspect in attempting to remove the body from the apartment. She was found uh, trying to clean up evidence inside the apartment. So with that information, the uh, homicide detectives got a warrant. Airport police actually caught Demetrio at the San Antonio airport trying to flee the city and arrested her as she was about to board a plane. She's been charged with murder. Police did not give a motive, but said Demetrio and Alvarez, this man, had some kind of relationship. A man is now in custody after allegedly shooting another man in the groin over the weekend. Police arrested 26 year old David Diaz Saturday for allegedly shooting a man multiple times in the legs and groin. The affidavit says the Diaz and the victim were at a friend's house when Diaz accused the man of messaging his girlfriend. The man told police that Diaz shouted, quote, I would kill for my baby mama before then shooting him multiple times. Diaz is now charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. His bond set at $60,000. Meantime, San Antonio police are looking for two suspects in connection to a gas station robbery on the southwest side. SAPD says the suspects walked into that gas station April 23rd, just before 2 a.m. Police say they grabbed some alcohol, tried to leave without paying. The store clerk locked the door, but one of the suspects showed a gun. The clerk then unlocked that door and the pair left. If you have any information, call SAPD at this number, 210-207-0300. The massive manhunt for the man accused of shooting and killing five of his neighbors is now on its third day. More than 250 officers from several law enforcement agencies have joined the search for 30-year-old Francisco Oropesa, this man. The shooting happened in Cleveland about an hour north of Houston. Moments before the massacre, Wilson Garcia and two other men walked over to Oropesa's yard and asked him to stop shooting his AR-15 because their baby was sleeping. Moments later, the gunman came to Garcia's home shooting his wife, three other adults, and his nine-year-old son. 
One of the people who died saw when my wife fell to the ground and was dying. And she told me to throw myself out the window because my children were already without a mother. So one of us had to stay alive to take care of them. There's now a collective $80,000 reward being offered for information that leads to Oral Pace's arrest. Today, Governor Greg Abbott's office responding to the criticism after calling the victims of the mass shooting. The governor called them, quote, illegal immigrants, end quote. That statement came out yesterday in a press release from the governor's office. Today, a spokesperson for the governor says, quote, we regret if the information was incorrect and detracted from the important goal of finding and arresting the criminal, end quote. You can read more about the governor's response right now on KSAT.com. By now, you've probably heard about Narcan, a medicine that can reverse an opioid overdose. Part of its ability to save lives, though, depends on people knowing how to use it. That's why the UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing has been training people all across the state. Courtney Friedman tells us what was once a COVID drawback has become a key part of training some hard to reach communities. You suspect that someone has overdosed. A three minute video of simplistic stick figures is saving lives across Texas. It's part of a training by UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing on opioid overdose prevention with the use of naloxone or Narcan. Administer a dose of the nasal naloxone in, in one of the nostrils and it may take a couple minutes. In 2018, it started in person, but as COVID forced virtual sessions, it allowed far more people to participate. Communities, um, we've not been able to reach in the past, so rural communities, um, some of the tribal nations. We've uh, reached a lot of um, counties that have what's considered to be mental health care provider shortage areas. UT Health Associate Professor Dr. Lisa Cleveland leads the training. The virtual sessions alone have now reached almost half of all Texas counties, including every county that had previously reported opioid overdose deaths. The program has also sent Narcan to 73% of all Texas counties. Now we regularly have 300, 400 people um, in a training, and so it's really expanded our reach a lot. And those are not just medical professionals. Many are from schools. A 500% increase over the past year um, of folks who work in schools who have been engaging in our training. There are also members of the general public taking training so they can be prepared. All of these boxes stacked at the School of Nursing have these individual Narcan sprays inside of them. For the bigger orders, for the schools and medical centers, the company ships it directly to them. But these boxes go to people in the community who want it at their home. Dr. Cleveland hopes to break the stigma that keeps people from carrying Narcan and says you can have it anonymously sent to your home or work. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. To order Narcan or learn about that training, head to morenarcanplease.com or the UT Health San Antonio School of Nursing website. The training is offered in both English and in Spanish. Check out live cam right now, 83 degrees. We closed the door on Fiesta in April. We did. What does May hold in store, Adam Kasky? <laughs> I wish I had the uh, most direct answer for you, but <laughs> as we start the first week of May, it's going to have some humidity and more spring-like conditions. Today, we started off at 58 this morning. That's a little below average. And then by the afternoon, 83 the high temperature which is exactly our average afternoon high. The record 99 set back in 1929. Notice those high thin clouds streaming overhead. These cirrus clouds are going to make for a spectacular sunset. Here's the visible satellite imagery, and we have these wispy feather-like clouds streaming up above us at about 30 to 35,000 feet. They're composed of all ice, and because they're altitude, give us a beautiful sunset. Between 8 and 8.25 p.m., the best viewing. Post your photos on KSAT Connect. We're going to talk about when the storm chances return in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. We're going to take you to the camera here at 281 in Loop 410. And I got to say, this is an unusual view this time of day. Usually it's much more crowded, both on the upper levels there and the lower ones of 410. But things look like traffic is moving along just fine. We are now just five days away from Municipal Election Day. Right now, early voting is underway with polls open until 8 tonight. Max Massey spoke with voters today about how voting is going so far with some last-minute prep. I've been all excited to come and vote. As you can see, I got my voting button here. 
And I got my little uh, patch there that they gave me. Ruben Garcia was one of the first voters this morning at Lions Field. One of the thousands of San Antonians who already voted. Through the beginning of today, we had 57,000 people vote in person. And of course, today or the la today and tomorrow are last two days. And they're historically the last busiest days when people sort of rush to the polls. Right now, numbers are on track with 2021 voting, but Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan tells me they were prepared for more people. That's because what's on the ballot and they saw an increase of registered voters. So that's an increase of a little over 9%. So when you plan elections, when you look at it, you do your numbers and your algorithms, we plan for another 10% boost. And we're not seeing that yet. So we'll see, maybe election day will be a big day for us. And as election officials really ramp up in the last couple of days of early voting and of course get ready for May 6th election day, they have to go through training and really put their lives on hold. We always do reviews because again, they haven't done this for four, five, six months. And so everybody needs a refresher. As for Ruben Garcia, he has a message out there for anyone who hasn't voted yet. Polls are open everywhere. It's time to get out and have a, have a voice and use your voice. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. And part of what's on the ballot right now, school bond proposals. You know your money goes toward the local school district you live in, but do you know how that district pays for those bond projects? Sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars worth. That's what we're diving into in a new case that explains today. Not only how bonds are paid for, but what you need to know about the wording that you'll see on the ballot this year that talks about your property taxes. I think that's that that's confusing for voters um, and clearly an attempt to con keep school districts from passing bonds. It certainly can be confusing. KSAT explains school bonds is coming up at 630. Still ahead on the news at six, the story of a little known historical marker at Fort Sam Houston, what it means to Chinese descendants in Mexico who risked their lives helping the U.S. Army in its failed pursuit of Pancho Villa. It's tonight on History Untold. Here's a look at what we're working on for you on the night beat. Frustrations over one of Fiesta's biggest events, the problems reported at the King William Fair, and the steps organizers say they are taking now to prepare for 2024. That and more on the night beat at 10. To start off Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, the story of a little known historic marker at Fort Sam Houston dedicated to the Pershing Chinese. In 1917, General John J. Pershing brought more than 400 Chinese to Fort Sam Houston. They'd helped in the U.S. They'd helped the U.S. Army in Pershing's failed pursuit of Pancho Villa after his notorious raid on Columbus, New Mexico. In tonight's History Untold, Jesse Degoriato talks to some of those descendants. That's my mother. Josefina Dong's mother from Mexico met her husband from China in a San Antonio boarding house. He'd also been in Mexico among the Chinese who risked their lives helping the U.S. Army. Yes, because a Pancho Villa was killing them. There's a picture of Chinese men hung at the railroad station. While many had already fled Mexico however they could, this vacant plot of land at Fort Sam Houston was the camp where more than 400 of Pershing's Chinese lived under the protection of the U.S. Army, including Josefina Dong's father, but he rarely talked about the past. They don't talk about something that's, you know, that's not a happy thing. Yet once here, it said they cleared land for Kelly Field and Camp Stanley ahead of World War I. What's on the historic marker is more than Christina Liu ever knew about her great-great-grandfather, <laughs> other than what was in a school textbook. But it was just like a short little paragraph about General Purging, nothing about Purging Chinese. We don't learn about this in history. Out of their very meager beginnings, they've given us priceless opportunities for us to do better. Amid the headstones, unlike all the others at Mission Park South. Many of those laid to rest here are Persian Chinese who wanted to be buried near one another, united in life and death by their amazing journey. Jesse De Guillado, KSET 12 News. History untold indeed. Absolutely.
Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying high above the Japanese Tea Garden. Things looking green out there as in so many spots around town. Always one of the most picturesque places in the city. Super green and yeah. lush. This is what we like after an above average month for rain. The first time we've had that in 17 months. Woohoo! Yeah. Right? April came to an end and man, it was. You got nice. a Myra Woohoo there, did you hear that? <laughs> Myra on a Woo Monday. Yeah, yeah, wow, on a uh, Monday. This is big. <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> Let's start with some other good news here. Since March 1st, the start of meteorological spring, we've had six inches of rain. 6.06 you know, .06 to be exact at the airport and that's 1.2 inches above average. So the spring overall is looking pretty good since January 1st. We've had nearly eight inches and that's about 0.6 inches below average, but we can still make up some ground here. Let's talk about the overall pattern and what we're seeing quite across Texas right now. The big story is this big upper level low that's just anchored over the Great Lakes and it's not going to move very much for several days, just spinning there, causing widespread areas of rain and windy conditions. But that's not influencing us. What's going to influence us is this upper level low, this cutoff low that's over Northern California here, this closed low that's going to be drifting southward. And really the importance for us is our location relative to that upper low and even the Big Blue H. Big Blue H over Mexico. It's not over us yet, but it's going to be over Mexico and due to the clockwise circulation around that upper high and the counterclockwise circulation around that upper low, it gives us this southwesterly flow up above us coming off the Pacific. So it'll add some Pacific moisture at times to our upper atmosphere and most importantly, throw some little impulses of energy overhead. Whenever we get into this southwesterly flow aloft, it's what we like to call the dirty flow because periodically just get these little bursts of energy pew 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 periodically from time to time and that's what we're going to have and so that's going to help with our instability to kickstart a few showers and storms starting on Thursday. So on Thursday we have those storm chances. All right, let's talk about temperatures for the month of April. We were half a degree above average. The coldest was 50 degrees. The warmest was 93 degrees. So we had quite the temperature range throughout April. Now, as we start May, we're going to be in the low 80s, near average the next few days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then by Friday into the weekend, we jump back up right near 90 for those high temperatures. Right now we're at 83 degrees, dew points up to 62. That wind's starting to blow off the Gulf of Mexico and it's going to continue to do so tonight. And that's just going to reinforce and increase our mugginess. See that rain or the rain, the, the wind coming in off the southeast, off the Gulf of Mexico. And that's going to boost the dew points overnight and lead to areas of fog and even some drizzle and sprinkles tomorrow morning. So a damp start to the day and you'll notice that mugginess starting tomorrow lasting all the way through the extended forecast. Here's our future cast for visibility 6 a.m. Anywhere from you know, a handful of miles to less than a mile. It's fog. It's one of those things that fluctuates continuously through the morning. But the farther east you are of San Antonio, the more likely you're to have the thicker fog. 8 a.m. future cache is showing, showing visibility of half a mile, but by 9:30 and 10, the fog really lifts and burns off and it's gone. But the dew points stay up 60s and 70s for the rest of the week into the weekend and just the entire extended forecast. It's that time of year. The breaks from the humidity become less and less and more infrequent. Fog and sprinkles in the morning at 65, mostly cloudy, 83 by the afternoon. We'll be 80 in Bernie, 84 in Pleasanton, 83 here in San Antonio. By Thursday, 40% chance of those storms, so scattered in nature, and then 30% Friday and Saturday. It's the time of year where anything that develops could of course become strong to severe. We'll take a look at April's rainfall in just a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, day one, the Houston Texans pulled off a double whammy, was yep. great. How did they do the rest of the rounds? Well, uh, NFL um, analysts across the league pretty much are giving the Texans a B plus for their NFL draft, so they did pretty darn good. They got Stroud, they got Anderson in the first round. Those guys indeed are leaders. Coming up, seven of the nine Texans draft picks have something in common, and Cameron, Cotillon is ready to rep UTSA. Coming up.
football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans selected two players they really wanted in the first round of the 2023 NFL Draft and former Ohio State quarterback C.J. Stroud and former Alabama linebacker Will Anderson Jr. They grabbed Stroud second overall and traded up from 12th to 3rd to select Anderson, who's a big-time pass rusher. All told, the Texans added nine new players to the draft, and seven of them all have one thing in common. Here's Texans GM Nick Casario. When you're a captain, it's about leadership, and leadership is about action. So, um, but it speaks to, I would say, what their teammates think of them, what the coaches think of them, and just their overall presence and commitment. Now, they're not going to be captains when they walk in our building, but uh, they're good teammates. They have the right mindset. Um, they put the team first. So I wouldn't say that that's a sole criteria that we base the pick off of, but um, it's a part of the evaluation. The national media graded the Texans 2023 draft class anywhere from an A, B plus to a B minus. Okay. Turning to golf, UTSA senior Cameron Carrion has earned an NCAA postseason berth as an individual and will rep the Roadrunners in the San Antonio Regional hosted by UTSA and San Antonio Sports on May 8th through the 10th at TPC San Antonio, the Oaks course, the same course that holds the Valero Texas Open. The San Antonio native and a Carner Road High School alum is one of six individuals who will play in the San Antonio Regional at UTSA's home course. Twelve teams, including number one seed Texas A&M, will also compete with an eye on advancing to the national championship. Cameron is ready to go. I'm lucky enough to, I mean, we didn't have such a great season, but I'm just really excited that I get to represent UTSA, especially because we're hosting this year and at our home course. So it's, it means a lot, especially because I'm from San Antonio as well. So can you expand on that? How cool is that that you guys are hosting the tournament out here on your home course? Oh, it's incredible because they host, well, TPC on the Oaks is um, host, well, the Texas Valero is played out here. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a really tough course, so it's very well known. And getting to play it pretty much every other day here throughout the whole year, um, I feel like it's definitely an advantage just knowing the course. Yes. You can still find the trouble. I do pretty often, but it's uh, <laughs> but it's awesome. I'm from here, so usually every year we made it to regionals as a team, mm -hmm. and we're always traveling. And it takes a. I think you have to apply to get the to the host site or to be the host site away in advance, and just to just to know or just to get it while I'm here at UTSA, it's it's awesome. There's nobody better. I mean, she's from San Antonio, loves San Antonio, um, loves UTSA. Um, so I'm really excited to watch her kind of show off in front of her uh, fan base. Cameron says she plans to return for her fifth year at UTSA. If you'd like to learn more about her, you can check her out on YouTube at golf at why not go pro. The UTSA baseball team moved up three places to number 22 in the land per the D1 baseball rankings. They are 33 and 11 overall this season and 16 and four in Conference USA. They are ranked behind fellow Conference USA baseball team Dallas Baptist, who moved up three spots to number 16. Now UTSA will host Dallas Baptist in a crucial three game series May 12th through the 14th. That'll be an exciting series. That is going to be a fantastic one. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Coming up next, KSAT explains how school bonds are paid for and what you need to know about the wording that you will see on the ballot when you cast your vote. Next. School bond proposals on the ballot this election day, and they come with big money attached, hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases. But how are these bond projects paid for? That's what we're breaking down in this case that explains, plus what you need to know about the wording that you'll see on the ballot that has to do with your property taxes. Now we're at 28,000 students. And if you look forward, in five years, we're going to be hitting that 35,000 student mark. In Comal ISD, a big bond hopes to accommodate some big growth. Three bond proposals in the district total $634 million. Just on the north side of our district, 
uh, on I-35, uh, 6,000 new homes. There's 70 active developments in Comal ISD right now. New schools, improved athletic facilities, technology upgrades, safety and security, it's all included. We're gonna put in an emergency operations center that will allow us to monitor those door sensors, allow us to monitor our cameras from a central location. Rapid growth is the challenge in Comal ISD, while age is the issue in Alamo Heights ISD. Well, all that money that we raise through bonds stays within Alamo Heights, uh, and we put it to use as far as our buildings go. This district's $371 million bond package also comes in three parts. It includes renovations to every campus, most of which date back to the 1950s, plus upgrades to athletic facilities, technology, and security. Think of a school bond like a home loan. You look at it like uh, you're buying a house. Uh, you get pre-approved for so much money to, to buy a house. And voters like you decide whether to give a school district that pre-approval to take out a loan. Most of us, if we were just to write a check out of our uh, checking account, we don't have the money to buy a house just by simply writing a check. It's something that we have to finance and school districts are in the same position. Texas public schools are funded by state and local dollars. Local funding comes from property taxes. On your tax bill, you'll see the tax rate for the district you live in. That rate is made up of two parts that get poured into two buckets. One is maintenance and operations. Think day-to-day -day expenses, not unlike your own budget. Money for things like utilities, fuel, and people. 81% of our budget is for salaries. The other bucket is what's called interest and sinking. I promise this is not a finance seminar. Nobody has to understand interest and sinking. All you have to understand is that's the funds used to pay off debt. When voters approve a school bond, that's what they're signing off on, allowing the district to take on that debt to make big projects happen. Once voters say yes to a school district's plan, the district sells bonds to get the money. You basically hire a, a banker who goes out to the, the usually the institutional market, the big mutual fund companies, Vanguard, and fidelity. You've got other institutional investors who, who are interested in school district bonds because it's it's treated under the tax law as a, as a municipal bond, like a city or a county bond. Uh, and there are, there are very clearly tax advantages to owning that kind of bond. The district sells the bonds, investors pay them for those bonds, and then this bucket of money is used to pay off the interest. It's to pay off the interest in the principal that's incurred just exactly like a mortgage. If you went out today and got a mortgage, you'd get one at, what, six and a quarter percent, six and a half, something like that. Pretty high compared to what we're used to. But in three years, if that is four or four and a half, then as a homeowner, you'd be better off refinancing that mortgage, right? The exact same thing can happen with bonds. The state has a tool to help school districts get better interest rates, which keeps more money in that bucket. It's called the Texas Permanent School Fund, and it's been around a long time, since 1845. The Permanent School Fund was endowed with land in the 1876 Texas Constitution. To this day, mineral rights from millions of acres of land in Texas and 10 miles out into the Gulf of Mexico pour money into this fund. One purpose of the money is to guarantee school bonds. Because the fund is so massive, hundreds of billions of dollars, that you would get as a school district at the, the a AAA rating, right? The top rating when you go out to, to sell. That means a lower interest rate that districts have to pay. But there's a problem. That fund is about to hit its limit. The IRS says Texas can guarantee roughly $117 billion in bonds. Texas schools have already applied for about $111 billion in voter-approved bonds. That does not include what's on the May ballot. Those bonds total $24 billion. So what gets approved in May may not be backed by the state if the IRS doesn't raise that limit. So what will happen very soon is that folks who are going out to the market to sell bonds will sell them at the district or the charter, their, un, their underlying rating which in very few cases is a AAA rating. And the lower it is, the higher the rate that that district's gonna pay, and that's gonna translate to local taxpayers. Speaking of translation, there's a bit of translation when it comes to the wording on the ballot, especially this last line that says, this is a property tax increase. Sounds straightforward, 
but it's not. The state recently began requiring that line, whether what you pay actually increases or not. Here's why. Remember those two buckets? Bonds can make this portion of a district's tax rate go up, but this rate fluctuates too and could go down. So that may not actually increase the total tax rate. In which case, if that concerns you, you need to call your elected official. It's what's happening in Comal and Alamo Heights ISDs this election. The ballot says each of its proposals is a property tax increase, but ask Alamo Heights. So we actually project our total tax rate will be less than it is today, but the INS rate will be more than it is today. Because the rate for that maintenance and operations bucket is projected to go down. Following the money can be complicated, but without bonds, these major school projects they would be impossible. We would not have the funds in our maintenance and operation budget to be able to do these projects. You essentially wouldn't be able to operate. You'd be bankrupt. Early voting for the elections is happening right now, and Election Day is this Saturday, May 6th. KSAT Explains covers a different topic from week to week. You can scan this QR code to watch any of our stories on demand. We'll be right back.